Corviknot is a really cool Pokemon, perhaps too cool. So what would you say if Game Freak specifically designed a Pokemon that channels its inner berry bonds to hit rocks into the air to knock them down? Enter Tinkaton is an extremely popular Pokemon that came out recently with Gen 9 and this little cute and girly aesthetic combined with the 220 pound hammer that it uses to steal and plunder loot like some sort of degenerate is honestly a pretty unique design. I like it. Tinkaton is a fairy and steel type Pokemon meaning that it carries 9 resistances and its only weaknesses are ground and fire which really aren't that common in Gen 1 and even less so since we aren't playing yellow version today. As far as the stats go. 436 base stat total isn't too shabby for Gen 1. That would put it about number 15 out of 151, and things like 94 base speed is enough to easily outspeed most battles in the game, as well as give you a little bit over 18% chance to crit since crits are based off of speed in this game. Now, 75 attack isn't the best, but when you've done runs like Onyx and Execute like I have, it actually looks pretty nice from where I'm sitting. Now, if you're wondering how I pick which stat to use between special attack and special defense, I use what I like to call the chancy rule, and basically that just means that I pick the highest stat. As far as the moveset goes, I will be adding in three moves today. There's a pair of fairy moves, and there's the signature move Gigaton Hammer, which we'll talk about in the footage. And outside of that, I just substituted things like Astonish for Lick, Baby Dot Eyes for Growl, Rock Smash for Low Kick, and Sweet Kiss for Confuse Ray. Now this gives a pretty solid moveset overall, that keeps it as close as I can to the Gen 9 learn set without adding like 30 custom moves. And if you're new, you might be wondering what's going on. And the long and the short of it before you comment down below is that I utilized the Pokey Red assembly. I built my own custom ROM. I added in things like Tinkaton, new moves, new types, and everything that's needed to keep the flavor of the new Pokemon intact while keeping the rest of the game as close to vanilla as possible. Just like last time, I had to make the sprite custom on my own and guys let me introduce you to this i think it's fine overall it's pretty accurate but for those of you who don't know generation one was hard limited to around a dozen palettes that it used for every pokemon and within each of those palettes you were limited to just four colors and two of those colors are black and white this means i had to do my best to use this almost red color and a very light pink to differentiate the hair the hammer and everything else and it was actually quite challenging but let's not linger around for too long because honestly, I'm ready to get into the action. And before we begin, I'd like to quickly say that if you enjoy the content, likes and comments are really what help letting YouTube know to recommend this video to like-minded individuals. So if you're someone new, maybe you're someone who just never interacts with the videos, or maybe you're a returning subscriber like Julio's Motivation, just scroll down and type in Dinger. At home, they call me Big Al and I hit Dingers. Because just like our friend Al here, we'll be knocking some jaws out of the park today. So just like Tinkaton does the Corviknot, hit a dinger on that like button. And without further ado, sit back, relax, grab yourself a Sodi Pop. And I think it's about time we just hop into it. This run will be broken into two segments. The bulk of the video will be my very first blind run where I didn't plan anything out and I'm just kind of getting an idea of what the Pokemon can do. When the first blind playthrough is over, we'll quickly go over the fixes, changes, and overall optimizations that will take us to Tinkaton's final form. I don't do this style of video often, but I do think seeing the blind run does help to give a little insight into solo runs in general. The whole process of doing it, especially if you don't watch things like my Friday live streams. Let's go over the starting learn set, and there are going to be two new moves here. First off, we have Lick, it's an awful move, and Growl, which is never going to see a single use over the entire playthrough. The first new move is going to be Fairy Wind. It's nothing special, it has no effects, and for all intents and purposes, it's just the Fairy version of Tackle, and overall, there's just not much to say about it. Now let's take a look at Gigaton Hammer. 
This is the signature move of Tinkaton, and it's extremely strong. First off, let me say that in Generation 9, this move's effect is that it cannot be used consecutively, but today, to avoid me doing a bunch of extra coding, we'll be Gen 1 ifying it by making it just have the Hyper Beam Recharge effect. This move has a base power of 160, and as of today, there are only three moves that exist that have a higher base power, and two of those moves are self-fainting moves like Explosion. Now if you factor in the stab bonus, we have a 240 effective power move, which is kind of nutty. The one huge drawback that we're going to have with this is that it only carries 5 power points and it might be a little bit hard to manage during the first part of the game. Looking at the first rival battle, I think you can see that I'm not really thinking about anything other than just hitting something over the head with a gigaton hammer immediately. Now I figured that even though it's resisted, 120 effective power would just be good enough, but I was wrong. This means not only do I have to recharge, but I take an additional two fairy winds to knock it out. And we're not going to see a ton of fire types in Gen 1, but starting the game against Charmander is just kind of a little foreshadowing that maybe we aren't quite as strong as you might think. Outside of that, I do the bare minimum and we can just go straight to Brock. I had tunnel vision here. I wanted so badly to gigaton hammer his Pokemon. With their rock topping, this monster of a move has 480 effective power and I just let it rip turn one. Now to my surprise, it did not one shot it. Not only that, the follow up fairy wind after I recharged isn't enough either, but after that we do move on to the onyx. Since its defense is higher, I soften it up with a fairy wind and that does about a quarter of its health. And from that range, I just figured I can finish it off with a gigaton hammer. But once again, it doesn't finish the job, and to top everything off, it had used Bide earlier, and I really didn't respect it because I figured the 480 effective power move would one-shot it, but here we are. We have our first reset very early. Now this was kind of a bit of a shocker. I never expected to have a move with that much power just fail to knock them out, but this is a blind run. I'm sure this probably won't be the last surprise, and I must say here, I did didn't fathom having to reset there and I never saved the game. That means that I have to start the run completely over, which isn't too bad. It's not that big of a deal. The solution here seems obvious. I did the bare minimum battles and we fought Brock at a measly level seven. So even something small like hitting level eight for that damage rounding threshold should make things just fine. Tinkaton is in the medium slow leveling group, which is the second best one in my opinion outside of the very rare fast experience group. And just on the very very first optional bug catcher, I do hit level 8 when the fight ends. Now on a blind run, I'm going to be a little bit more cautious, so I battle the next optional trainer too, and that puts us at level 10, and you can see the wonders of the medium slow leveling group in action today. Now the drawback here is that I have to use the very limited PP of Gigaton Hammer, and that does force me to heal before we go back to Brock. Now as for the rematch with the rock solid Pokemon trainer, level 10 makes a world of difference. My huge hammer hammer slaps the Geodude down in one blow, but the Onyx with its high defense still survives, but at that point, it's kind of just cleanup duty and we can actually progress in the game. Now there's a lot of runs that start off with powerful moves like Psychic or Ice Beam, and the run usually revolves around careful management of power points to get the most out of that move so that you don't get slowed down just using worse moves in general. Now the difference between those runs and today is that we only have a measly 5 power points and it's going to be really hard to avoid healing during the first half of the game at least. The problem with the learn set is that if you're trying to preserve gigaton hammers, the poison types that are going to be really plentiful during this early part of the game are going to resist fairy wind and overall it makes this little part of the game feel really unintuitive and it's definitely in need of some cleanup on further playthroughs. I do have to heal once again before Mount Moon and from here I have a sneaking suspicion that Misty resists resisting steel type moves could potentially be an issue, so from here I am picking up two additional battles inside of Zubat Cave. The first battle is the Super Nerd, now he's easy, he gives a ton of experience, and the second is going to be the Hiker that has two Geodudes and an Onyx. Since we have Gigaton Hammer, I do take him out, but it's worth noting that once I look at the 
damage numbers, Fairy Wind might be enough for all of them like you see here on the Onyx. I do play this part pretty well overall. I'm able to hit level 18 going into Cerulean, and I guess I just have to hope that's enough for rival number two. The first thing here is that I outspeed Pidgeotto, which is always great. Now the second thing is that I had actually planned on just going hog wild with Gigaton Hammer and just healing after the fight. Now here, I one shot the sand attacking bird and we can move on. And I haven't really mentioned low kick yet, but it is pretty solid. Outside of me kind of fumbling around on Abra, I just finished the fight off pretty much with low kick and I actually saved four uses of Gigaton Hammer. And with that, I think I'm just gonna try to go from here and just make it through Nugget Bridge without healing. At the end of the day, it's, it's really not that bad. You can see on this last battle that it does get really tight, but I didn't use the elixir, so I do have that option later. Now the first thing to note is that I do replace Lick with Confuse Ray, and all of my damaging moves are now resisted by poison outside of me expending my limited uses of Gigaton Hammer on it. With tons of rocket battles and Koga coming up eventually, that could slow us down quite a bit. As for Misty, Fairy Wind is good enough on the Staryu, but now let's take a look at the main attraction. With my hammer being resisted, I continue tossing out Fairy Winds after I set up a Confuse Ray, and I know at some point, even a 120 effective power move will knock it out, but I do play cautious until I get hit with the crit, and then I start to bonk it with my hammer, and ultimately, we take the battle. I do crit here, but I honestly, I'm not going to know if it mattered until after this run. Now we can take it all the way down to the SSN, and it does make me shed a tear that Body Slam is not something that Tinkaton gets in Gen 9, but after getting the rare candy, I think we can talk about rival number 3. Gigaton Hammer can still take out the Pidgeotto in a single hit, so it's a non-issue. Now as for the spot overall, I'd just like to say that I'm not used to using something like Hyper Beam. You see it so rarely in a solo run, only like 3 Pokemon learn it naturally, and when you're doing a blind run and you almost have no clue if something's gonna survive, some mistake are gonna happen. Now here, I make it to the end of the fight, and even though fire does resist steel, it's still extremely powerful, so I go for it immediately, and it doesn't one-shot. I have to recharge, and in that time, I do get blasted with some embers, and overall, that's our second reset of the run. In the rematch, I just simply soften up the Charmeleon a little bit, and that means I can finish it off with a Gigaton Hammer right after that. Now you might notice that I am critting quite a lot, and honestly, that does make it kind of hard to get a feel for damage, but if you look at the overlay, you do see that I have over an 18% chance to crit, and honestly, that's pretty respectable. That's really good. After that, it's time for Lieutenant Surge, and when you make these custom ROMs, you have to be really accurate with your top charts because you're going to be entering the data for all of these new types, and electric resisting steel is something that's probably really easy to forget. Now here, I know it because I had to code in how steel works, both offensively and defensively against every single type, but I wonder how many people just didn't know that. Anyway, as far as this battle goes, it's pretty much Fairy Wind all day. I do get a crit on the Pikachu, but more than likely it would have been a two shot anyway. It's kind of irrelevant. On the Raichu, I guess I can just say that I'm a little surprised because I didn't heal. I expected to, this to be a mistake and me to reset, but it just didn't do a lot of damage. And just like Starmie earlier, I'm just kind of chipping it down to the point to where my gut tells me it's time to bonk it on the head with a Gigaton Hammer, and I can just finish off the job and eventually I do get that bonk and we're moving on. After that we are still limited in the same ways. Now this means when you make it to the junior trainer that has the double bell sprout double oddish and she's just itching to put status conditions I don't want to take any chances so I let the hammer loose. I let it bonk anything that moves and I just want to avoid any shenanigans. Now this does mean that I have to heal once again right before going into rock tunnel and speaking of which almost everything in here resist a large chunk of our current moves. Now, back at level 27, I had the opportunity to learn Slam, but it's only 75% accurate, and honestly, that's really bad. But when optimizing, it is something that I will take a look at. As for the Hiker, I decided to try out the super effective low kick to see if it can just make things really quick. I maybe could save some PP, but it's not one-shotting stuff. Now, we are seeing the average 75 attack really be a detriment in terms of making this run fast, 
So more than likely, Gigaton Hammer is gonna be required on this one as well. Now we can move it along to Celadon. There's no need to shop just yet, but it is worth noting that I now have access to two PP ups and I immediately use them on Gigaton Hammer. A 40% increase in PP is what I would usually call false advertisement, but here I'm hoping it lets me be a little bit more liberal with my hammer uses. Now as far as the rocket hideout goes, there's just not much to say. I am picking up high money items like always. I manage my hammer uses and that just makes Giovanni a pushover like he always is. When I'm done with that, I do opt to take on Erica. I resist grass, I have great speed, and with Gigaton Hammer, I felt confident about doing this first so that I could squeak out just a little bit more money for when we go to the shop after. And my intuition turns out to be correct. This one is just three quick one hit bonks and it's just an easy battle. We don't really have to talk about it anymore. As far as blind runs go, knowing when to shop, how many vitamins you can get, and if those vitamins will even help you later in the game is something you simply cannot know. Now here, I'm just a little bit short of being able to afford six vitamins, so I do sell a full restore. And with our pretty good base speed, I don't need carbos, so I just pump up that attack stat with six proteins. The other huge pickup here is Rock Slide. Now you can go back and forth all day between this and Earthquake, which one's better for coverage, but there's no denying that Rock Slide gives great coverage against things like Lorelei and Gyarados in the late game. And more importantly, it's super effective damage to fire types, which walled us off pretty hard before this. It is also neutral to poison types, but that's really not as, it's not nearly as useful. As for rival number four, I guess we get to utilize Rock Slide on Gyarados and Charmeleon, but the important thing is that level 35, we get access to play rough. The 90% accuracy is just not my favorite thing in the world. And normally it has a 10% chance to lower attack, but in generation one, things that do the same thing like Aurora Beam have a 33% chance instead. And that's why it's higher here. Essentially, all this is gonna be good for is to be a good dragon slaying move, but I'm not sure even then how much it's gonna be needed outside of just doing some whatever damage on a fighting type or something. Now moving on from the tower, I do make my way all the way down to the safari zone. I gobble up the extra vitamins down here as well as get the final HMs of the run. And like always, I have a decision to make between Sylph and Fusia for our next destination. Now today, I will be choosing Sylph. And if you peep over at the learn set, you might get a little inkling of why I would choose to go here first. Now, when I'm done with the typical errands, I go to the seventh floor for the very beautiful TM Swords Dance. It's just sitting there waiting on us. Now, this will likely allow us to not have to grind anymore for the rest of the run. And a two stage attack boosting move combined with Gigaton Hammer honestly has me tingling inside. It got me excited. After that, we can take a look at rival number five, and there's no need for a fancy transition today. Now, I will say that in blind runs, it's really hard to know just how much you need to set up. And generally, you're gonna be on the cautious side of things and you're gonna set up all three. But here, I just do one. This allows me to get the sweep ready and outside of execute surviving a rock slide, the single boost is enough. Now, what's impressive to me is that I do not have the speed badge boost just yet, but I still outspeed things like Alakazam and Charizard. So that's actually really promising. Now, overall, when you have an easy time on this fight, it generally bodes well for the rest of the run, and I am very happy with this result. From there, let's go down to Fuchsia for the next gym, and on the first juggler in Koga's gym, I want you to notice how poison gas still poisons me despite still being immune to poison. I honestly can't explain this behavior on a technical level, but if I had to guess, it's because poison gas doesn't actually do damage, and it kind of just adds the poison status as an effect. And I'm guessing that the code is just kind of wired to not actually see it as a poison move and that lets it bypass it. But really, at the end of the day, that's just speculation. It's just something kind of interesting I noticed in the playthrough. Now it's funny because I purposely didn't buy antidotes because I thought steel was immune to poison. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys, there's zero chance that I'm gonna use a full restore. So we will be poisoned for this next 
next fight. So now we can just skim over Koga. Now to keep this one short, we get a little swords dance set up just to be safe. And then I go into Gigaton Hammer. We start bonking everything. It's a series of one shots and we don't have to linger on this one. Next, I take a brisk swim down to Cinnabar. And when I get done, when I get there, I'm about to go into the gym and I realize that I haven't fought Sabrina. So even though I do think that we'll be fine against Blaine right now, I do head there for an easier matchup. And honestly, guys, I highly doubt that Swords Dance is needed here. But like I said earlier, a blind playthrough has a lot of bloat in it and things like setting up when you don't need to or maybe setting up too many times. They will be factors in shaving off entire minutes on subsequent runs. But yeah, this was overkill. I just kind of stick to Gigaton Hammer just because I wanted to make it even more overkill, I guess. But for real, I mainly do this because I'm going to be using Rock Slide for Blaine. We head back there and after we answer the age old question about Tombstoner, brother. Let's see if one of Tinkaton's weaknesses can finally give her some problems. Now, people that are actually familiar with solo runs probably know the answer to that is an emphatic no. Here, I set up every single one of my swords dances that I can, but I do get burned by an ember. Now, normally, the burn status is a death sentence to physical attackers since it's going to be having our attack. But with the swords dance boost, I can not only offset the burn, I can actually still get a sizable attack boost after that. Now this allows me to do what you would expect. I sweep the fight with the super effective rock slide, and just like that, we're moving on to the last gym. Now we all know that red and blue version of Giovanni just isn't great. And like I mentioned, I likely overset up here just to guarantee everything's gonna go down in one bonk. And just like that, we don't even have to talk about it, the gym portion of the game is over with. Now, after the fight, I use my very first elixir of the run just to save some time. Now it's worth noting that I was picking up extra ethers and max ethers and other spots of the game with the idea being that I could just use them on Gigaton Hammer and I could keep it going, but I never actually used any of them. Now when it comes to rival number six, there's two important things to start off the fight to know. Now the first is that I resist every single move that the Pidgeot has. And the second thing is that this is the point of the game where it no longer has sand attack. Now this means I can very comfortably set up all the way and you guys know where this is going to go from here. Now everything from this point on is just fodder and it's not even close. I do get an unlucky crit and I fail to one shot the Alakazam but it really doesn't matter. Now the only thing that this fight shows us is how much damage a flamethrower will do to Tinkaton. I miss my initial rock slide and honestly the flamethrower doesn't even do that much damage. It's a lot less than you would actually think and I just finished the battle on the next turn. Now looking ahead at the Elite Four, I just, I'm just i just kind of winging it here. But I really don't see anything ahead that would pose a huge challenge. If you watch my other videos, you know in the optimized runs I often have a lot of spots where I use early rare candies and that's just because I get a lot of value in terms of experience out of them as well as I can just push my damage ranges up to make fights more comfortable. But here I haven't used a single rare candy for the entire run run and because of that I am going to skip the victory road candy. Before I head into Lorelei I do use 9 of my 10 rare candies because I'm saving one for the champion fight to reset my experience but with that out of the way let's see if this is going to be as much of a cakewalk as I think it's going to be. We can almost cliff notes this entire thing. Sorry for the spoilers, guys. Now on Lorelei, I'm just gonna set up. The Dugong will go for rest or growl because we resist ice. Growl can be annoying just because you have to use Swords Dance an extra time or two, but it's really not that bad. Like you would expect, once you are set up, you can use the mostly neutral Gigaton Hammer or you can use Rock Slide and that pretty much dices everything up. It's very easy and honestly, I don't think anyone out there expected anything different. Now quickly, we can scoot past Bruno. I do have play rough here and what's funny is for some reason I fully set up to boost my attack but I end up just sweeping the entire fight with play rough but it's Bruno. He's weak to steel on some of his Pokemon. He's weak to fairy on the others. You already know how it's gonna go. Now we can take a quick little look at Agatha as well and honestly 
I play this one really bad. I go to set up and I honestly, I set up too many times. I get confused. It's not too big of a deal, but when your attack stat is this high, you just do a ton of damage to yourself with confusion hits. And here on the first Gengar, I go down to just 35 HP, which is totally just my fault because I didn't heal before the fight. But from that point, once the confusion wears off, I do outspeed everything else. I have a lot of gigaton hammers, and I think you guys know where it's headed from there. Overall, offensively, there just wasn't much Agatha could do, and realistically, me hurting myself like that over and over until I faint was about her only win condition. As for Lance, I open up the fight with a tried and true swords dance, and I'm sure a lot of you are thinking, wow, what a brave strategy. It does hit me with a hydro pump after, and it does just enough damage for me to actually stop setting up and just go for the damage. It's worth noting that even without the badge boost, Tinkaton does outspeed Aerodactyl, and that's kind of impressive. But play rough overall just kind of puts in a little work here, and I give Aerodactyl the Corviknight treatment with a Gigaton Hammer, and we can just move on to the end. The Champion's Pidgeot is going to function in about the same exact way as the last time. There's no sand attack here, and I resist every single move. Now, I'm going to fully set up. No one's going to stop me, and I'm sorry for the anticlimactic Elite Four, but this one is essentially a done deal. Now, since I had such an easy time on this Elite Four, I do a little bit of testing here. I try to see if, like, the Gigaton Hammer can one-shot the Gyarados and the Charizard, even though it's resisted, and it still does. Now, the Bonk just honestly honestly doesn't care if you resist it, especially when it's backed by Swords Dance. And at the end of the day, I take the battle, and Tinkaton finishes this run incredibly strong. Our first time here is 2 hours and 51 minutes and 31 seconds. It's respectable, but there's still a lot of work to do to optimize. Now I guess for some blanket thoughts on the first blind run would be that this one is a little bit slow at the start, but it really picks up about the halfway point. I think learning damage range ranges where Gigaton Hammer will one-shot, as well as learning when you just overall don't need it will actually help out a lot, and earlier rare candies might make those little things a little bit faster, but we'll see guys, don't go anywhere, because coming up next, we got the optimized run. A lot of the optimizations for this run are going to come at the very start and pretty much the first half of this game. Now, unfortunately, there's just not much you can do on the starting rival with its fire typing. Now, I found it best just to let the hammer loose immediately, even though you have to recharge, just because he loves to go for a growl, and that's exactly what happens here. Now, it's a slog. Overall, it takes four turns, but outside of a crit, there's really nothing you can do about this. In Viridian Forest, I do cut out the second bug catcher. Now, like I said in the first run, just the very first optional bug catcher will put you at level 8 and that's just good enough. Level 9 for Brock puts Geodude in a guaranteed one shot range and after softening up the Onyx just a little bit, you can take it out as well. Afterwards, I do not heal. You only have 3 uses of Gigaton Hammer and guys, this run pretty much came down to just carefully planning out your uses of it. Here having 3 uses is fine because in the lead up to Mount Moon, there's only 3 poison types that are mandatory and skipping the heal after Brock saves just a little bit of time. As for Mount Moon, I do the exact same thing, but Gigaton Hammer isn't required for the optional hiker. Fairy Wind is a guaranteed one shot, you don't have to waste your valuable PP. At the end of Mount Moon, I still hit level 18, even though I cut out an early battle, and that just kind of demonstrates how insignificant a lot of early game grinding can be as you progress later in the game. Now on the blind run, I pressed on to the entirety of Nugget Bridge after arrival number 2. Now here, I use my remaining 2 PP of Gigaton Hammer on the first trainer just so I don't waste them and then I return to heal after. Right here is going to be a pretty big optimization. I wasn't happy with the damage numbers in some testing and using two rare candies very early here gives you the most value to kind of smooth out this part of the game. And guys remember that Nugget Bridge and the route to Bill's house is the most trainer rich segment of the entire game. And I'm just going to focus on this aspect of the run one more time because it's just so key. The management 
placement of Gigaton Hammer is everything for this run. I use all five of my hammers on targets that would be a two or three shot otherwise. And this time when I beat the Hiker, I use the Elixir immediately so that I can keep up this pace. At the end of the round, I also pick up the Ether, and I'm actually going to use them rather than just spending a ton of time overhealing in Poke Centers. Another bonus of these early rare candies that wasn't necessarily planned was that you do hit level 25 going into Misty. This puts the star you in a guaranteed bonk range and on the star me I would have used it but it used to turn one X defend and at that point straight fair you end is the better play the next thing I did was that I completely cut out the rare candy on the SSN the gentleman with the two fire tops it just simply took too much time and the fact that I didn't even use rare candies on the blind run meant that this was just a good opportunity to save some time now let's talk about surge for a second now in my damage calculations with my software it should have been a 100% chance to knock out the Raichu. So I didn't heal here. I put myself at risk because according to my calculations, there was no risk. And what turns out to happen here is I don't knock out the Raichu. And I scratched my head and I tried to figure out why that was. And guys, it's because of a typo. I left out a T in electric and it thought it was going to be neutral damage. So it was wrong. Here's what the damage is supposed to look like. And I guess I got lucky here because it really doesn't do a lot of damage just like the first time. But I thought I would call myself out on that. Now we can just jump ahead all the way to the end of the rocket hideout. Here is the point to where I utilize the first ether. Now this keeps me going straight to Erica and overall using the ethers after you get the PP ups just make the most sense because it's just going to give you the most value. Now it's worth noting that at this point in time I am roughly 15 minutes ahead of the blind run in the game and that's a pretty good improvement. From there it's pretty much more of the same. Now I have the uses of Gigaton Hammer carefully planned out and when it's time for seal I do anchor myself to the saffron pokey center which is important for a little time save coming up soon as for rival number five only one swords dance is actually required and overall you only have to use one gigaton hammer on execute which frees you up to use more gigaton hammers on the other there's a lot of poison types here and you'll see them a lot in this little section of the game when I'm done with Giovanni now I use the max elixir just because it's a little bit quicker than healing I dig out that takes us back to Saffron we talked about earlier and here we're gonna see another time save I found when I was looking at the damage numbers now I found out it's actually not needed to hold off on Sabrina at all you can do her before Koga and you might think that there's some complications fighting her this early but I still at this level outspeed everything outside of the Alakazam and it turns out on the blind run it was extreme overkill even with zero setup Gigaton Hammer is still a one shot on every single Pokemon now the only thing that could potentially slow you down is if the Alakazam uses Reflect, but we don't see it here and we never have to know. When I'm done with that, I do fly to Viridian to heal, and just like with the Saffron Poke Center earlier, I'm strategically anchoring myself here, thinking about the end of the game. This is something that I've only recently started doing, and I'll talk about it soon when it becomes relevant again. As far as Blaine and Koga go, we don't have to watch these fights. Koga, for example, only takes one set up and Blaine can take one or two. I did go with two setups on Blaine just because Rock Slide only has 90% accuracy and it would take the same amount of turns regardless. So now let's talk about that anchor earlier. I haven't healed since I flew to Viridian when I showed it in the clip like 10 seconds ago and taking that small amount of time earlier means that now when I dig out of Blaine's gym I'm already in the city with the final gym. To me it just feels pretty nice. It feels efficient. I don't know if it's actually great. Once again I skipped the rare candy in victory road and this time we do have less overall candies but we do have just enough to reach level 55 which is nice for damage rounding purposes now my friends let's take a look at some little mistakes and all that kind of stuff i fixed with the elite four so on lorelei you only need a single swords dance gigaton hammer will do its job from there but you do need to swap to play rough for the slow bro because it's a little tanky and honestly guys it just felt really good to bomb jinx over the head with this gigaton hammer it's one of the first things i thought about when i was envisioning this run as far as bruno there's actually no setup required big shocker bruno's the weakest person uh you could just go straight play rough even on the onyxes you'll just one shot everything guaranteed now looking at agatha this is definitely the part on the blind run that i overthought the most and wasted the most time now simply put most of her pokemon are just really frail and i do outspeed every single one of them and my friends gigaton hammer
Hammer is conveniently a guaranteed one shot on every single one of her Pokemon, and this is just a massacre. All you gotta do is hold down A, use Gigaton Hammer, and this one's over. It's actually really quick. Next up is Lance, and I opt to go with only one setup for this fight. Now, the only benefit doing two Swords Dance would give you is that it puts Gyarados in like an 81% range, but if you look at this, I have a slightly less than 40% chance to knock it out, so I just kind of roll the dice. It saves a little time if it pays off. Now, the first time, it doesn't pay off, but Lance uses a Hyper Potion, and the second Rock Slide does win that coin flip, and it takes us on. Now, the only real concession I noticed about the adjustment overall was that I don't outspeed the Aerodactyl anymore, but it can only hit me for resisted damage, and it's just honestly not that big of a deal. It's not worth changing the run for Aerodactyl. And finally on the champion, the magic sword stance number is two, and it's almost exclusively for Gyarados. Now the jump from one sword stance to two maxes it out, and let's look at this. If you're looking at it and saying, Matt, 81.64 isn't maxed out, that's because it, like, it calculates the crits. Since crits ignores stat boost and you can see here that a max range crit wouldn't knock it out the calculations have to subtract my 18% crit rate so this is maxed out my friends so when the dust clears and the time finally stops Tinkaton finishes with a final time of 2 hours 21 minutes and 57 seconds I was able to trim off around 30 minutes from the blind run and I did the run flawlessly but unfortunately we're gonna start comparing these cross gen runs against each other and Scala Dirge was, it's just the best. It outclasses this run by about seven minutes. There's also a Groudon run. I don't know how it did just yet because it's, I'm still, that's gonna come out before this, but I haven't done it yet, okay? So don't ask questions. So in the official tier list, the idea is that the A plus tier is reserved for those rare two hour and 20 minute runs that had some weaknesses like Gengar and Haunter. But if Tinkaton was a gen one Pokemon on the tier list, I would probably make an exception. Now, it's less than two minutes over that criteria, but the flawless run is just hard to overlook. Now, at the end of the day, Tinkaton has an incredible mid and late game, and I think it might actually have the fastest elite four time from start to finish that I've ever seen. Now, if I would have given it another steel move at the start, or if this Pokemon just had something like a 90 or 100 base attack, then this run might be something that's really good and really scary. Now, over Overall, this was a really interesting run. I essentially started out with a stabbed hyper beam and kind of managing the run to avoid the recharge time as well as optimizing the very low five power points. It felt very restrictive and it's not something I'm sure that any other run I've ever done to this point has made me feel. And I think that's about it for me. If you made it this far, subscribe to the channel if you like solo run content. And if you haven't already and you want to help me out, leave a comment, hit the like button. Now, I would say perhaps I've been over editing the last couple of videos and they've taken me a little bit longer and I think for the sake of just keeping up I might dial that back just a little bit but any feedback is welcome especially if you like the editing I would really like to know because it you know it's positive it makes me want to keep doing it and as always special thanks to my channel members I really do appreciate the support and it means a lot to me uh, I've talked personally to some of the new members and I tell them I say hey I'm like a few weeks ahead on videos and it might be a few weeks before you're actually in the videos but they're all cool about it they understand so shout out to you guys you're the MVP of the channel and I think that's gonna do it for me guys I think I'll catch you on the next one bye